Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. I'm going to be doing a, a talk, a couple of talks last night uh, on the minimal fact approach, uh, just as uh, Gary Habermas would state it. And I did two videos uh, doing the minimal fact approach, very similar, but just with a little bit of nuance in those. I've done a lot of talks on the resurrection of Christ and I'm going to look at my old paper that you can get this on my blog on Atheist Examine blog if you want to read it. Um, and I want to go through the paper again. As I go through it I'm going to be bringing up um, new issues, new information and I hope that that will be a blessing to you and a help. So um, without further ado, let's pray. So if I've got time, I'm going to be making uh, some apologetic videos. Uh, I feel a little bit refreshed because I've just had a, a drink of water. So um, I think I should be okay. Okay, Father God, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your encouragement. We thank you for your love. And Father God, I ask for your forgiveness and cleansing. And Father, I ask that this talk on the resurrection, this lecture, uh, Father, that you would bless it, that you would use it for your glory. And Father, I pray that it would lead to people getting saved. I pray that you'd use the information for your glory and I pray that your fame and your glory would spread through this lecture and that people would come to know you as Lord and Saviour. Um, those who've heard my lecture before uh, and know my notes that I have on the subject, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to <clears throat> Um, add stuff in that's not in my notes and in my lecture. Um, Josh McDowell was a student and he writes on December 19th 1959 at 8.30 p.m. during my second year at the university I became a Christian. That night I prayed. I prayed four things in order to establish a relationship with God in a personal relationship with Son with his son, the personal resurrected living Christ. Over a period of time, that relationship turned my life around. First, I prayed, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. For I confess those things in my life that aren't pleasing to you. And I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me. The Bible says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Isaiah 1.18 um, third, I said, right now, in the best way I know how, I open the door of my heart and life, and I trust you as my Savior and Lord. Take control of my life. Change me from outside. Make me the type of person you created me to be. The last thing I prayed was, thank you for coming into my life by faith. It was a faith produced by the Holy Spirit based on God's Word and supported by evidence in the facts of history. Read, um evidence demands a verdict. The reason why I quote Josh McDowell there is this man as a student investigated whether Jesus rose from the dead. He, he, he was challenged so he went and studied the subject. He actually became convinced that Christ rose from the dead by looking at the evidence. And I would encourage you that if you honestly uh, look at the evidence <clears throat> then you will find the truth. Now, first of all, I want to say <clears throat> that we have to consider um, presuppositions. We have to be honest <clears throat> and we have to consider our presuppositions. The idea that an atheist or a Christian or anybody comes to history without some kind of bias is just not correct. 
we come to historical information, all of us with a bias. Dale Allison, a formidable scholar in his paper, The Historical Christ, March 6, 2012, Duke University, noticed that Orthodox scholars produce a Jesus that fits their creed, and the skeptics produce Jesus to fit their ideologies. For example, the Irish scholar Dominic Crossan writes a life of Christ as an Irish revolutionary is un, who is under imperial Rome. Do you see what I mean? He, he, Crossan is culture and his understanding of life shapes the way he understands the historical material about Christ. We have H. Ramirez in 1694 to 1768. He wrote a life of Christ as a Jewish revolutionary. D. F. Strauss, 1808, 74, he writes the life of Christ as a G as a myth, as as um and in 1823, 92, he wrote a life that of Christ and said that Jesus was a romantic visionary. H. J. Holtzman, 1832 to 1910, wrote a life of Christ and said Jesus was the teacher of timeless ethical truth. Johann Weiss, 1863 to 1940, Jesus was an eschatological teacher, a figure who should be um, fitted into the first century Judaism. Albert Schweitzer, 1875-1865, Jesus failed, was a failed prophet but towering personality. And we need to go back to the Jewish context and avoid the early church historical spin. Rudolf Boltman, 1884-1976, saw Jesus as a preacher of timeless truth, but it was his existential philosophy that was his hermeneutic in understanding who Jesus was. So, what your intellectual horizons are, what your culture is, will shape the way you view Jesus. We see this with the new atheist. We we see um, the British scientist Richard Dawkins considered Jesus as a product of the later church, a mythical figure who might have existed. He gave no analysis of any historical data in depth in his book, The God Delusion. The British journalist and writer Christopher Hitchens, in 13th of April 1949, to the December 2011 in his book God is not great in page 40, 51, 60, 64, 68, 89, 109 to 23, 125, 128, 130, 152, 158 and 159 uh, in his attack Hitchens says that Jesus was an avatar of Seth a Gnostic invention who makes more sense than any early church fabrication he quotes Bart Ehrman but doesn't engage with any other scholars. He obviously is biased, not only using one scholar and using scholarship that he doesn't really fully understand. Just an aside, um, the four Gospels are quoted by the Gnostic Gospels. That would absolutely destroy these uh, ideas that Hitchens wrote in his book about Jesus. The American writer Sam Harris in his book End of Faith on page 35, uh, page 96, 97, page 82, 83, 156, 57, 158, 241, two, um, as a Jew but politicizes him at every turn. He understands Jesus' divinity and death as political tools used by the church against the Jews, a theological anti-Semitism. Michael Onfray, the French philosopher, in his book Atheist Manifesto, page 115, 127, said Jesus' existence has not been historical, historically established. He makes great, sweet, great sweeping claims, but fails to cite scholars' evidence to back up what he says. He's even been noted to get his facts wrong. He said there was no such thing as a crucifixion in the early first century uh, Jerusalem. Um, 
Josephus said the Jews are so careful about funeral rites that even malefactors are being sentenced to crucifixion are taken down and buried before sunset. Josephus, Jewish War, 4.3.17. So, and we have also found a, a crucifer, a, a foot with a, 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 cruti, a, a, a nail through which showed there was crucifixion at that time. So what we've done is we've looked at the New Atheist, we've looked at the history of scholarship on Jesus, and we've looked that it's all been biased. Um, the New Atheist, um, all four of the ones that we just looked at, on Frey and Hitchin, Sam Harris and Dawkins, uh, have not done any extensive study on Jesus. All four ignore engaging with scholars who might disagree with them. All four are polemical, have a polemical agenda against religion. They tend to read the life of Jesus in the light of their political struggle against religion in the present. They tend to attack the virgin birth and see that the main evidence against Jesus being a real historical feat. Um, and see that as the main historical figure. The rest of Jesus' life is superficially treated only to make a political point against religion in the present. This can hardly be seen as fair, objective, historical treatment of the life of Jesus. Then we have the Bayes theorem. Uh, in the debate, James White asked Dominic Crossan about bias in historical method. Dominic Crossan replied, we have presuppositions, but we also have data. That's in the resurrection debate, Crossan and Borg versus White and Renehan. This debate took place on board ship 2005 in the Gulf of Alaska. You can see it on YouTube channel Alaska 1689. Crossan implied that we can get the historical data even with bias. Uh, just an aside though, it's interesting that Dominic... Well, even in his work, if you look at uh, a book called The Cambridge Studies, Cambridge Companion to Jesus in the first chapter, Dr. Evans writes an article and there he critiques Dominic Crossan, showing that Dominic Crossan, when he says that Jesus was a Sinaitic philosopher, if you look at the Galilean architecture, Roman and Greek architecture in, Gal in, in the area of Galilee, Crossan would say that shows that there was Sinaitic teaching and ideas and Jesus was a Sinaitic philosopher, uh, a wandering from a peasant village. But all the evidence indicates, even though they were Greek and Roman architecture, that the people there were thoroughly Jewish. All the archaeological evidence for funerals, uh, for burials, all reveal a Jewish culture. So, in other words, Dominic Crossan is not as objective as he even thinks. The point what I'm getting at is most scholars are not aware, even historians, and even historical Jesus experts are not aware and as honest as they need to be about their bias. How are they shaping, how are our presuppositions shaping the material that we look at? What steps have we taken to make sure that our presuppositions are not blinding our interpretation of the facts? Have we consistently looked at our presuppositions to see if our presuppositions are consistent because not all presuppositions are accurate. As we've looked at the historical Jesus studies and the New Atheists, we all have to be more conscious of our bias, more honest and upfront about it, or we'll go around in circles confirming what we want to believe rather than letting the evidence speak for itself. Scholars try to trick the public into thinking they are more objective than they are. An example is the scholar who used Bay Theorem, the atheist Dr. Richard Carrier, and there are Christians who've done the same, using the Bay Theorem as if this is an objective way to show that Christianity, uh, that atheism is correct in its interpretation of Jesus. This theorem tries to show the probability of each set of probable causes for an absurd outcome can be logically uh, ascertained from knowledge of the probability of each cause and the conditional probability of the um, understanding of the outcome of each cause. 
To be fair, it must also be noted that evangelical scholars have also used the Bayes theorem to prove their case for the resurrection. I have to say that again. But the Bayes theorem is not used by any known historian. Uh, it's not used by any reputable historian, really. Or if it is, it's very rare. Mo most historians don't use it. What this argument is from the Bayes theorem is an argument from um, scientism. Susan Hack, an atheist, has given a great lecture in warning us about using science as some authority to give our ideas more kudos than in reality. Science does not, act, does not actually substantiate but remains neutral on the resurrection of Christ. If you look at Susan Hack's Six Signs of Scientism, Dr. Hack's talk at the, Rock, at the Rockman Institute of Philosophy at the University of Western Ontario on January the 7th, 2011, engages scientism, the view that natural science is the most authoritative way of looking at the world interpretations of life. What I'm trying to say is the atheists like Richard Carrier who would try and use some kind of scientific basis to critique the resurrection i.e. use the base theorem, it's only a form of scientism, it's only a form of trying to use science as an authority but the base theorem is not actually scientific in terms of historical inquiry, it's very subjective. Um, David Bartholomew, uh, a, a statistician, uh, in page 117 of The Resurrection of Jesus in Mike Lacona's IVP book, writes, The great difficulty applying the theory is that it's often not at all clear what value should be given to the prior probability. David Bartholomew says, Thus the base theorem is subjective. Page 117, Lycona. The resurrection of Jesus. Dr. McClough says virtually no historian uses it. Page 117 in uh, Lacona's book, Resurrection of Jesus. Dr. Tucker says it is clear how Bayes theorem can be worked. It is unclear how Bayes theorem can be worked out in practice. Page 117, Resurrection of Jesus. So. We've got to acknowledge that we have presuppositions. We've got to acknowledge that we come to the historical information with pre-ideas. Now, does that mean to say that if all these history of all these scholars shows that they're biased, does that mean that we can't get to historical facts or information? No. What it means is that we have to be aware of whether our presuppositions are consistent and the best presuppositions and we have to also try to make sh limit our presuppositions in the evaluation of the facts to be honest and fair the atheist position generally not all atheists but the atheists that we dealt with here the Sam Harris and Dawkins and Onfray and Hitchens would see reality as materialistic. They would all be committed to evolution. These are their presuppositions. Now is that consistent for historical inquiry? If we believe in evolution, then there is no meaning ultimate to life. There is no general pattern to history. So why would we try to look at history for a pattern history for a meaning if our own intellectual foundation doesn't provide that. Our presupposition is in conflict. There is a, a, a disparity between our presupposition and the actual historical inquiry. The Christian position says that history has a purpose and the Christian position has the uh, presupposition that reality is real and that when we investigate it we can come to knowledge so it is a basis for objective knowledge so the actually 
and the Christian presupposition actually is the better presupposition to go and do history than an atheist position or a skeptical position. Now, this because all as atheism is is an absence of belief due to a lack of evidence. But what the atheist doesn't realize is that that doesn't wash because one has to deconstruct the language that the atheist is using. That requires intellectual tools of philosophy, linguistics. It's not enough. It's not as simple as to say, I don't believe in God due to a lack of evidence. In other words, the point is that the atheist, <coughs> whether they like it or not, will have presuppositions that impinge on their understanding of reality and that impinge on whether their presuppositions are consistent in the historical task. So there has to be a discussion on the table about the atheist presupposition and the Christian presupposition. Other presuppositions that uh, play for the Christian is the Bible. For the Christian, the Bible is the Word of God. The Old Testament is the outline to the New Testament, etc. For the Christian presupposition, there is a belief in God, the Creator. For the atheist, there's often a, a presupposition that religion is no good and is controlling. So all these presuppositions play and have a role in our interpretation of the facts. They have to be on the table for discussion before we get to the historical task. I would say that the Christian position is a positive position providing a positive epistemology, a positive historiography in order to do historical thinking. I would say that it's the only way Christianity gives you a grand narrative of history. That is to say that history has an, a meaning and a purpose and is moving towards a meaning and purpose. And if that's the case, that it means that if I'm doing historical inquiry, that it is purposeful, meaningful, and provides real knowledge. But if I believe in evolution, if I believe that history is not going anywhere, then why would I want to try and understand the past? The other thing in historical inquiry is that is secondly is the enlightenment had a big influence on how we understand history. The enlightenment was a particular cultural phenomena and yet that particular cultural phenomena has if that particular cultural phenomena is biased. Why is the Enlightenment position more superior than say a Japanese historian's methodology or a Chinese historian's methodology? So the Enlightenment presuppositions have to be critiqued before we do historical inquiry and debate whether Jesus rose from the dead. So the atheist assumes the Enlightenment position, but the Enlightenment position can be challenged on many fronts. For example, the Enlightenment split a reason and morality. It made a dichotomy between what is human. It put more value on reason than anything else. But actually human beings are actually not only reasonable, they are moral. And you cannot have reason without morality or morality without reason. But morality is at the heart of every intellectual task. You cannot do science without being honest. You cannot do philosophy you cannot do history without being honest. In other words, morality is at the very core of how we know. And the atheist position puts tremendous emphasis on reason and tremendous emphasis on the material understanding of the universe from a scientific perspective, which goes directly back to the Enlightenment position. But the Christian 